Okay. Well, welcome, Mark. Thank you very much for agreeing to do this webinar for T-Cell Spain. And over to you. Um, thank you, Mandy. Um, this uh, webinar today is going to be about using the sound chart in teaching pronunciation. Uh, you can see the sound chart behind my head. Um, just before we begin, let me uh, just explain that I'm sitting in Chester in England. It's a Saturday morning, nice and sunny, and uh, the window right behind you is um, right on the street. So it's a race day, it's horse races in Chester. So you might hear some people chatting as they head down to the race course today. Um, but I don't think they'll be drunk yet. They'll be drunk a bit later when they come back. Okay, so let me begin um, with, I'll just share the screen. Um, um, so this is the sound chart workshop. Uh, right there at the bottom of the screen, you can see um, a web link uh, where you can actually download in high resolution the sound charts, which you will see in the talk, the webinar today. Um, there are six versions of it actually. Uh, I'll explain a bit more about them as we go along. Um, okay. So there's the sound part um, with the top part there, the, the hexagon. The hexagon contains the vowels, the vowel system of English, and the box that's the box of consonants at the bottom. Uh, so I'll get, I'm going to start by talking about the consonant and then move on to the vowels afterwards. And uh, here's a, here the key concept that I want to go over as we go through the webinar today. So number one, stop consonants. Uh, number two, aspiration. Three, friction consonants four, voicing, five, articulation of consonants, six, phonemic versus phonetic, seven, spelling and sound, eight, articulation of vowels, and nine, minimal pairs. So those are the key, key concepts in today's webinar. So starting with the consonants then. Um, consonants, in a way, are relatively easy to teach because the, um, the tongue and the mouth are in their contact positions, which you can easily explain, more easily explain than the vowels at least. You can see them in many cases. For example, if I say p as in pen, you can see that my lips are closed together. Um, so, so that's actually visible, relatively easy to show and demonstrate to students. However, um, the, the problem, especially with Spanish speakers learning English, the problem is that uh, in Spanish, the, the consonants are very different often if they're at the beginning of the word or at the end of a word. And uh, so it's often the case that uh, the Spanish student will alter the consonant sound if it's at the end of a word. You can take, for example, the b in bin. That's liable to be very different um, and, and could sound like the b in vest in a different part of the word. So the problem for Spanish speakers with consonants is that really. Um, I'd like to begin exploring the box of consonants uh, by looking at the top um, left corner. There's a box of six there. Um, well, let me just uh, first of all explain how it's organized. The box in the top left 
is um, what I'm calling stop consonants, um, where the air passage through the mouth is completely stopped, albeit just for an instant. Um, and then on the right hand side in that column there you have friction consonants. In this case the sound isn't completely stopped. The, the air passes through but the uh, space is reduced so it is friction as it passes through this small space. So one consequence of this is that uh, you can make friction consonants as long as you like. For example, let's do the f in fish. F fish. You can make that as long as you like, whereas the p in pen is instantaneous. It's, uh, you can't elongate it. Um, you can see down there at the bottom right, these two sounds here have a combination starting with a stop sound and then moving into a friction sound, for example, t -sh, t -sh, t -sh, chair. So those are stop and friction consonants. And then in the, re the remaining corner, we have vowel like consonants there and glottal consonants here. So that, that's the overall organization of the consonant box. So these stop consonants in the top left, you've got, um, I can arrange them in columns and rows. And if you look at the numbers one to six down the side, these are descriptions of either a column or a row. For example, number one, the back of the tongue closes the gap. Uh, if you look at the picture, you can see that this is the case here, here, and here. In other words, that description matches all of those sounds in the bottom row or row C. So number two, the air comes out of the nose. Let's see. Here we can see a picture of air coming out of the nose. Here, here, and here. So number two is column three. Um, number three, the top and bottom lips close the gap. If you look at the picture, you can see that this is the case here, here, and here. So number three is column, sorry, is row A. Number four, there's no vibration in the throat. The these um, zigzags here represent vibration in the throat or voicing, as we'll see later. So we can see that these three here don't have that vibration in the throat. So number four is column one. Number five, the tongue tip touches the back of the top gum. Uh, here we can see it in the picture there. The tongue tip touches, touches the back of the top gum, there, there, and there. So that is um, row B. And then finally, um, there's a small puff of air from the mouth. That's what this symbol represents here. So number six is column one. So that little exercise, which you can do with students, is to raise awareness of how these sounds are articulated. It's interesting that, uh, for example, the m of man has exactly the same position as p and b, and similarly with t, d, n. So they have, that's why they're in the same row, because they have the same position of articulation. So key concept number two is aspiration. Um, I'll come out of the share for this. So um, aspiration you can use as a practical experiment to demonstrate to students the sound in p 
as in pen, and the difference between that and b as in bin. The difference, what's the difference? You can use a piece of paper. Um, tissue paper is the best, but ordinary paper works a little bit. So you can um, demonstrate it like this. Pen. So it clearly um, is a puff of air from the mouth moving the paper, whereas in b, 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 ben, b, 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 hardly anything. So if uh, you really want to exaggerate the difference between those two sounds, then uh, you can use the paper, tissue paper test. Um, you can also feel it on your hand if you say, p, p, p. you should be able to hear sorry, feel the, um, the puff of air on your hand. Uh, it's great at the beginning of a word like that, um, but uh, you don't get that same aspiration when the p occurs at the end of a word or in the consonant cluster. So plan, 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 it's much less. So if you really want to demonstrate this, in a crystal clear context, choose a word where the sound is at the beginning of the word and not part of a consonant cluster. So I'm going back to the share screen. So um, key concept number three, friction. Friction consonants. As I said before, a friction consonant um, is one which uh, doesn't close the airway completely. It allows a little bit of air to go through a small gap, as you can see in those pictures. So you've got um, the, in the first picture, you've got the small gap is created between the top teeth and the bottom lip, as in or in the second picture you can see the gap is between the top teeth and the tongue and the air is going through that small gap creating and in the third one you have the gap is between the tip of the tongue and this lump the back of the gum here And in the, the last one here, the tongue is pulled back a little bit further back than that lump, curled back slightly. Look. So the air is going through that gap. Um, it's interesting uh, to do those as a continuous sound. Um, to raise students' awareness of what their articulators are doing, uh, like this. Repeat after me. So easy, is it? Okay, so those are friction consonants. This thing is a key consonant number four, and uh, here's a photograph of me at TESOL, Spain. Um, this experiment is uh, putting your fingers in your ears to tell the difference between, for example, s and z. Uh, I should explain that uh, these pairs are unvoiced, voiced, unvoiced, voiced, unvoiced, voiced. This uh, doorway here shows that these two sounds are related to each other, but one is unvoiced and one is voiced. So 
this experiment is to um, show students the difference. So when you go like this and you go, that's okay. If you do do it with, it sort of uh, explodes in your in your head. Another version of that is with your hand on your throat. No vibration. Vibration. And uh, one final version of that experiment is hand on top of head. You can feel a vibration for the. So that's voicing. Uh, those are the pairs in the chart of unvoiced and voiced, unvoiced, voiced, and here. That's what the meaning of the, the little doorway between those squares is. Um, voicing is not always easy to hear in all contexts. Have a look at this. Here's me again at TESOL Spain doing some minimal pair work. On the uh, left you have the unvoiced and on the right the voiced. So sip, zip. Um, so uh, try this. I'll, I'll say uh, one of these words and you have to look at uh, the word I'm saying and uh, using our eye tra tracking technology we will see if you're looking at the one I intend you to look at. Um, zip zip everybody's eyes uh, are looking at this one very good that's exactly what i intended um next we have racer or razor racer or razor which one am i saying racer racer mm of doubt there but most people are coming out with this one which is the one I intend. Now the last pair are price and prize. Price, prize. Which one am I saying? Price, price. Okay there's a bit of doubt with this one this is the one I'm trying to say here. But the fact is, uh, when the consonant in question is at the end of the word, price, prize, there isn't much space for the voicing to be heard because there isn't anything afterwards, after that sound, in which to hear the voicing. Um, so there's another clue here. It's the uh, vowel sound before is shortened when the consonant is unvoiced. So, for example, price, the I, is a little bit shorter than the prize, I. So there are two clues you can use to have belt and braces. Listen for it being shorter. To, for this one, that's a strategy. Think of this one as being clipped, price, prize. So, in other words, the voicing isn't working alone in this context. You could say the same here, of course, racer, razor, the A is shorter here than here. Okay. <clears throat> um, key concept. Five, articulation of consonants. You've got um, to raise students awareness of tongue, jaws, lips and voice. Now if you look at this picture here there is a, a key area just here which is a lump above the top teeth, the alveolar ridge. Um, and the tip of the tongue is close or touching that lump in such a lot of consonants that it's uh, worth 
getting students aware of that lump pretty early on. So try this. This is what you can do with your students. Ask them to do this. If you can show them uh, this diagram on the board or draw it on the board and put your finger here, tell your students to put their tongue where you're putting your finger. All right, so do that. Put the tip of your tongue here and now move it over that mountain and up to here. That's about as far as you can go without choking yourself. So get them to be very familiar with that area of the top of the mouth and uh, invent a word for that. You can use the word alveolar ridge if your students like uh, technical language or you can get them to invent a word for it. You can call it the tooth mountain, whatever you like, it doesn't matter. But just make sure that they're aware of that. It's a, it's a very important place uh, for English consonants. Um, as I say, the other key things are the lips here, which close in sound like p, and the teeth, the top teeth, very important. And then the back of the tongue touches yeah, for, for some consonants like k and g. And then we have the voicing idea, which I mentioned before, with the vibration on the throat. Um, I find it's nice to be able to make these things physical. So this is the top teeth, the top jaw, and this uh, band here represents it, a piece of cardboard. Uh, so you can, that sort of represents the alveolar ridge really, that strip of cardboard like this. So if your hand represents the tongue and the strip of cardboard represents the al alveolar ridge, you can show students what's going on inside your mouth. Uh, because the problem here with uh, teaching pronunciation of sounds is for a lot of them you can't see what's going on, it's hidden inside the mouth. Um, so it's nice to be able to somehow see inside the mouth and this is a way that I used to do that using a strip of card, model it into a curve like that and put your hand inside to make a tongue inside that area. So in that um, top right picture, you can see that the, the fingers are touching the end. That makes, that can make the sound, for example, n, n, or t, or d. In the top left, there's a bit of a gap between the fingers and the end. So that's a friction consonant. For example, s, where the air is squeezing through that gap. Um, bottom right, you've got the tongue curling back a little bit, allowing the air to escape through that gap in front. Um, and that uh, I would use to represent r, as in run. So you can um, give these strips like this to students for them to make their own models. They can model something and then get their partner to say which sound they're making just to make it to make them very aware of what's going on inside their mouth then there's lip reading uh, this is uh, the more visible aspect of teaching consonants you can actually see the consonant for example in the top right i can see this uh, woman's teeth touching the bo bottom lip which makes me think she's saying something like as in fish. F. In the bottom left, you can see the teeth touching the tongue. Uh, so I think she's saying th, as in think, th, th. Students can um, look at themselves in, the, in their phone camera and they should be able to see that they're uh, 
mouth is doing that kind of thing, looking in a mirror or in the phone camera. They should look at their own mouth and make sure, for example, for th, th that the teeth are visible. Um, for example, Spanish students uh, often have a, don't distinguish b and v. So, if using this mirror technique, they can if they they, they need to be able to see the teeth for the v, v and not for the b, where the lips completely close together. This one here looks to me like shh. Uh, there's often protruding lips for shh, as in shh, shh, as in the gesture for telling people to be quiet. Shh. You often project your lips. You can see that in the in the picture there. And the, the, this one here looks to me like w w w, with the rounded lips and a very small gap. So you can um, use lip reading as a technique to talk about consonant articulation as well. Uh, okay, so that was the consonant box. I'd like to move on to the vowels next. And um, in, in a way, these are more difficult. A, because there are so many of them in English compared to Spanish. And B, because the articulators in the mouth don't make such, don't make that contact. So it's difficult to explain how to articulate vowels. Um, not, not impossible, though. I think we should give it a, a go. So what I will do is explain how the vowels are arranged here in this hexagon and talk a little bit about how they're articulated as well. So here's an infographic showing, explaining how the vowels <coughs> are arranged. And there you can see the outer circle are the relatively long vowels. All of these can occur at, at any place in the word, the beginning, middle or end. And at the very corners are the relatively pure long vowels. We have E, U, E, O, A, E. They're actually a, a good place to start if you're going to explore the sound chart with your students. I often start at the corners. Why? Because you can extend these sounds as long as you like. <clears throat> so it really gives um, a big sample, a long sample for your students to um, get their mouths around. Um, so, say after me. <clears throat> so these long vowels have the characteristic that you can extend them indefinitely. The middle of each side, on the other hand, these are diphthongs. These are um, sounds which begin in one place and finish in another. Consequently, you can't extend them indefinitely. So you've got ear, oi, o, ow, i, a. You can't extend a because if you do, it becomes something else. A most of it, it was this, and then it changed to the A only at the end. So you, you can't extend them without changing them. And the same goes of the inner circle, which are the short vowels. These ones can't be extended without losing their personality altogether. For example, E. Eh. If you extend it, eh, it becomes this one. It changes. So part of its nature is it's short. And interestingly, these ones on the inner circle don't occur at the end of a word. They need to be checked. They need a consonant after, after them. 
to shorten them, to keep them short. So if you're going to demonstrate these alone, not in a word, you have to stop them like this. I, I, I. So instead of making a long sound, e, just to repeat the short sound, I, I, I. Ooh, 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 ooh. If you're doing an exploration of the chart with students, it's good for them to um, have mnemonics. Uh, what do these sound like? For example, the ooh, ooh, ooh sounds a bit like a chimpanzee, right? Um, ooh sounds like an exclamation of surprise, maybe. Ooh. Um, the ah sounds like maybe what the doctor or the dentist asks you to do. Uh, say ah, uh, or maybe it's the sound you make when you see something really cute, like a cat photograph on Facebook. Ah, uh, and so on. So you can give these different sounds their own personalities when you're going through, or get the students to do that. Um, here you can see that um, the mouth position is represented in the position on the hexagon. So here, closed, that is the jaw is relatively closed, and the wide, that's the mouth, the lips are wide. Closed, wide, open, wide, middle, wide. So these are with wide mouth. Here we've got closed, round, ooh, oh, and open, round, oh, or, oh. and then these three, uh, just neutral, relaxed position. Uh, right in the centre is the schwa, which is um, a vowel which is reduced in an unstressed syllable. Um, this sound is different in kind, it's not really comparable with the other ones. And uh, I think it's worth not dealing with it in the same lesson. For example, if you try to get students to understand the difference between duck uh, and this, it's just a recipe for confusion. The difference between them is not really about the difference in quality, it's about the difference in the role it plays in the word. It's, it's a reduced syllable. Okay, and uh, finally I should mention the R in brackets. This, um, these sound charts are intended to be accent neutral as far as possible, because when we're teaching pronunciation, I, I don't believe we're teaching a specific accent. We're teaching um, the system in any accent. So uh, in, in the example words here, bird, fork, arm, hair, and ear, you can see in the spelling there's an R, which in my accent is not really audible as an R. The R merely changes the quality of the, um, the vowel before it. For example, if you remove the R, that's bid, bid, bird, bid, bird. The R is part of the vowel in my accent. In other accents, however, <coughs> the R is audible as well. For example, bird in American or bird in Scottish, which sounds more like the Spanish version. So uh, I wouldn't like to say that one version is better than the other. It, it, you, your accent is your accent, uh, as long as you're intelligible. Um, so these, these um, R's in brackets show the R to be optional in those five sounds. Um, okay, so
Hi everyone. Um, I'm not sure what's happened. I think Mark's internet connection must have dropped out. Um, I'm hoping he comes back in quite soon uh, to carry on telling us about this because uh, I think it's very interesting. So fingers crossed that he'll be back soon. Um, I'll keep the room open and um, uh, stay in. <laughs> uh, don't go away. And hopefully he'll be back with us soon. I think it must be a problem with his internet connection. Okay, so, so hang with us for a bit and we'll see if we can get him back. Mark, are you there? Okay, we can see you. Yeah, I can see you and hear you. Thank you. Okay, carry on. Um, sorry about that. Uh, I've got a pretty poor internet connection around here. Um, let me get back to that screen we were just on. Okay. Uh, I think that's where we, yeah, that's where we got uh, cut off, isn't it? So uh, I'm going to go a little bit more theoretical here and talk about the difference of phonology versus phonetics. Um, so we've got um, bag, beg, and big. And uh, a phonemic transcription has the slanted brackets. Um, let me just... Yeah, the slanted brackets here represent that this is phonemic. Um, now, here we have two transcriptions in phonetic, and that's what these square brackets are indicating, that this, these represent the actual sound, whereas these represent the meaning, if you like. So here we have in accent A, bag, beg, big. In accent B, we have beg, big, bug. Um, both of these would be represented by this. For example, beg is this in accent B. So the phonemic transcription represents um, that um, sound, that, um, in, that phoneme in any accent. Uh, the reason I put these uh, chess pieces down here is to make uh, the point that uh, the phonemes don't have a specific shape. They can be any variety of different shapes and still play the same role in the game. So when we're teaching um, phonemes, the precise quality we're not teaching an accent, we're teaching something that plays that role in any accent. Um, yeah, <clears throat> more on that point. Um, look at this one here, air, as in hair. Um, that can be represented by this which um, it looks a bit like a diphthong. It's not really a diphthong, certainly in, in my accent. And um, <clears throat> Alan Crittenden, for example, recommends that it ought to be written like this now in modern English. Um, or in American, it might, you might prefer to write it this way. The point is, it doesn't really matter what the symbol is. Uh, Shakespeare said, a rose by any name smells as sweet. It doesn't matter that it's called a rose. It, uh, the nature of it is the same. Well, the same goes here. It doesn't matter which symbol you use. It's still that corner of the chart. Um, in fact, you could not use symbols at all. And this may be um, better for some of your students. Uh, in this particular type example of the chart, uh, just, I've just used typical spellings instead of uh, symbols. Uh, young learners may find this better. Or for example, students from uh, Arabic where they're having to learn two scripts, the phonetic and the English at once might be a bit much, so you can just have conventional spellings instead. The, the way you use the chart remains exactly the same. So, for example, the typical spelling here is face, A something E. 
or here the typical spelling is A-I-R as in hair. Um, but as you know, uh, English spelling is uh, rather chaotic. And if you look at this pair of homophones down here, hair, hair, pronounced exactly the same in my accent, hair, in American, for example, hair. But they're spelt the same. So this is a, 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 um, a typical spelling, not the only spelling that needs to be borne in mind. Um, so concept, um, key concept number seven is about spelling and it's worth um, comparing the phoneme and its various forms of spelling by um, putting them in a chart uh, like this one with rows and columns. Um, repeat after me. Beer, beer, dear, fear, feared. Peer, here. Uh, you can go down the column like that, um, sort of asking your students to repeat after you so that they notice that all of those sounds, all of those words have the same vowel in them, the same vowel sound. Um, and then you could ask students to uh, identify what are the possible spellings of that, and they will uh, identify the EA and the EE, -E, and these are the two most common spellings. And then down at the bottom, you've got two less common spellings, the IE, that's a rare one, and ERE. -E. So you can do a similar thing with all of the other columns. You can see that the, for this, in this column, the range of spellings is relatively small. Here, you have, uh, Hi again, everyone. I don't know if you can see me or not. Um, we seem to have lost Mark again. Um, I'm sure he'll be back with us in a second. Uh, I think he's having some problems with um, with the internet. Mark, if you can hear me, we can't hear you. Um, yeah, I think he's he's dropped. Stay with us a few minutes, and we'll see if we can get Mark back again. Everybody, sorry about this. <laughs> Hello. Hi, Mark. We can hear you now and see you. Thank you. <laughs> Actually, I think the video is frozen again, Mark. Are you there? Can you hear us? Seems to have frozen. Can you hear us, Mark? We can see you on, well, I can see you on the screen, but I, we can't hear you. Seems to have dropped again. Um, hang with us just for a couple of minutes. Everybody will see if we can get Mark uh, back again. Hopefully it won't take too long.
Okay, I'm not sure if we're going to be able to reconnect with Mark now. Um, he seems to have completely disappeared. Um, so I'm going to say thank you for joining us and uh, sorry that we've had to cut Mark's webinar a little bit short, 10 minutes short. We've missed probably the most interesting part at the end there, but, but certainly um, have heard lots of interesting things uh, from Mark this morning about how to teach the sounds and, and different ideas for for making the sounds and how to make that clear to the to the students in our classes. So um, I'd like to thank you all for coming and just remind you again that um, the call for papers for our convention which is in um, the, from the 8th to the 10th of March in Oviedo next year uh, will be opening soon and um, that don't forget to join us on the 15th of June which is a Friday 10 o'clock in the morning for, for Kerry Jones's webinar. Hopefully we'll be able to, to bring you the whole webinar without any technical problems. Thank you all very, very much. Um, you'll be receiving your certificates through, the, through, the, um, through your email very soon. Thank you and goodbye. Have a lovely weekend. Sorry about that again. Um, obviously got a terrible internet connection around here today. Probably to something to do with the Chester races, I should think. Uh, anyways, uh, I'd like to move on to key concept number eight, which was articulation of vowels. And um, here's a, uh, a good way of demonstrating the, the, the key areas of the vowel space in the mouth. Um, let's start with, um, let me uh, just a moment. Yeah. This corner. Repeat after me, please. E -u and now move between them. E -u -e -u -e. What's going on here? Well, um, ask your students to do the, do the same thing again, but focusing their attention on what's going on inside their mouths, like this. E -u And uh, some of them will notice perhaps that the uh, lips are changing shape. That's easy to see. Um, I ask them what their tongues are doing and they might say that the tongue is moving up or down or whatever. Here's a little experiment you can do um, about the tongue. You can take a clean pencil like this one and put it in your, in your mouth doing those two sounds like this. E see that the, the pencil goes in um, so the tongue is moving back when the pencil goes in and these cats here represent what the tongue is doing here this cat is leaning forward up forward here up back and um, so the, the tongue is nearer the front here and nearer the back here that's why these vowel this vowel is called a front vowel and that vowel, a back vowel. Um, so you can raise students' awareness to what the tongue is doing. Um, one of my students said, oh, my, well, my tongue stays in the same place. It's my whole head that goes back. Um, so that's another way of putting it, but it amounts to the same thing in the end. The other dimension is this one. E, a, 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 e, a, e, a. You can ask your students what's going on here and they'll probably notice immediately that the mouth is opening. Um, so the mouth is relatively closed here and relatively open here. And this one you can demonstrate using the finger and thumb experiment. Ask them to put the uh, finger on the nose and the thumb on the chin. Go e a e a e a and they should notice that the jaw the bottom jaw goes down for this one. So that's why the, this vowel is called a closed vowel and this an open vowel. Um, so uh, there's the, the, the uh, experiment. Uh, okay, more closed, X is shorter, X is longer. E, A. Um, 
on the chart, the closed, the vowels with the mouth more closed are near the top, the vowels with the mouth more open are at the bottom. The vowels with the tongue, tongue nearer the front are on this side, on the left side, and nearer the back on the right side. Um, if you want to have a little game to get students more familiar with the vowel chart, um, I, I use this one. Uh, here are, here's the chart with example words in. And uh, first of all, I say example word, and the student doesn't, doesn't see, isn't looking at this chart. The student's just looking at this. So you say a word like night, and they have to identify where on the chart that is and point to it, night. And they might point to bike, hopefully. That has the same vowel sound. Um, you can do a little root, you know, night, and then egg, eh, egg, and then jump across there to cup, and so on, making a root around the chart. Um, once you've done that a little bit with you speaking and the students following on the, on the map, then you can give, uh, the last time I did this, I had one student at one end of the room with this, and the other student standing at the wall where the chart was, and one, this student um, was saying a word and the other was pointing to it. And then there was another team doing the same thing and uh, the teams would get a point for every correct identification. So that's uh, various things you can do with, uh, with this as a way of getting students a little bit more familiar with how this chart, the vowel chart works. Um, okay, uh, the final concept I want to talk about is minimal pairs, and here are some examples. A, hitting beans. B, hitting bins. C, heating beans. D, heating bins. Here you can see um, you've got two minimal pairs. You've got hitting versus heating, and you've got beans versus bins. A minimal pair is two words, a pair of words, which are different only in one phoneme, in this case, the vowel in the middle, beans, bins, beans, bins. That's a minimal pair. And uh, minimal pairs you can use for a variety of games and activities in pronunciation teaching. For example, in this one, you say one of the phrases and the students identify A, B, C, or D, for example. Heating bins, heating bins, heating bins. Which one, one am I saying? Well, I'm trying to say this one. So hopefully you looked at that. So you can do that and then the students can do it for each other. Each other. One student says the phrase and the other student identifies the picture. Um, minimal pairs are very useful. Why? Not because uh, the difference between beans and bins is a very common confusion. No, they're, in, they're very useful because they demonstrate how um, a change in the sound can change the meaning completely. It demonstrates that to students and it allows them to practice with a focus on one specific sound because uh, you can't focus on everything at once. There's usually a lot of problems at once in pronunciation but uh, this a minimal pair allows you to focus very specifically on one problem. So that was the nine key concepts, uh, which you can see down in the list here. And that's the end of the webinar. Um, this uh, website down here, HancockMcNoll.com, I will put the slides up on that website shortly for you to uh, download if you want to. Uh, this is a picture photograph from TESOL Spain uh, with my new books Prompack. So do have a look at those on Amazon or wherever. Um, and I'm happy to say that those books have been shortlisted for an Elson's Prize uh, and the judgment will come sometime in June, June the 18th. So fingers crossed for that. Um, thank you very much for attending today and uh, and that's it I, i'm happy to take any questions that if anybody wants to 
ask any. I'm sorry for all of that trouble with the uh, internet connection, by the way. Uh, it really uh, puts you off, doesn't it, when you have to keep waiting for 10 minutes in the dark. How can we help students become more fluent, even as non-native speakers? Um, okay. Uh, that w wasn't really the topic of today's talk, which was about the chart. However, um, I, I think the best way of becoming more fluent is to practice um, sounds in connected speech. Um, for example, I use a lot of raps and chants, um, something um, like um, one, of, one of them that I can remember, remember off by heart is uh, you won't get fit just sitting on a seat if you want to get fit, got to get up on your feet, etc. Things like that, um, where they practice a given uh, poem or rhyme or chant, uh, it enables them to join the words together uh, and helps fluency in that way. Um, all right, the, there are four books you, you're asking about. There are four books, uh, here they are. Now, they are not different ages or levels, they are different approaches. For example, book one are um, workouts, which is my term for drills, really. Um, book two are puzzles, so they're more um, for raising awareness um, of features of pronunciation. Book three are pair works for practicing communication communication games and book four are poems which is rhymes and chants and songs and so on so they're not different levels they're different approaches uh, they're complementary i often use more than material from more than one book to teach a given pronunciation point um, There's a question about uh, vowel and consonant description to accent description. Um, how do you go from uh, how do you go from vowel description and consonant description to talking about accents? Uh, I think it's important that uh, to recognise that you, the teacher, your accent is basically the model in your pronunciation teaching. It's not really realistic to think uh, that's uh, the model is elsewhere. You, the teacher, are the model. Whatever your accent is, is the model. Uh, so you don't need to try and pretend to have a different accent. And uh, this was a mistake I made at the beginning of my teaching, thinking that I would have to, for example, change the way I speak and say, instead of grass, grass, which is not natural for me. Um, what you do need to be aware of, as far as possible, is the ways in which accents um, vary a lot. So coming back to what I was saying earlier about the optional R in a word like um, girl or bird, uh, I would model that sound in my own accent, bird, but I would also make students aware of the range of accents possible for that. For example, bird or bird. Um, because that's a very important area of variation, whether the R is pronounced after a vowel or not. So model your own accent, but uh, raise awareness of other accents would be my approach to that. Um, let me see, I'm looking at any more questions. Um, for three to seven year olds, Somebody's asking, would the material in these books be suitable for uh, very young learners like that? I think um, some of the chants and raps would be. Uh, however, um, some of the more cerebral activities, such as the puzzles, um, book two, maybe not, uh, because you don't really 
uh, take such an analytical approach with that age group. So uh, some, of the, some of the material would work for that age group, but it isn't really designed for that age group. To be honest, it's more intended for um, <coughs> teenagers and adults. Uh, using all four books in class. Somebody's asking, would you use all four books in one class? Yes, I, I often do, because uh, I have, um, I teach spe uh, specifically pronunciation classes. So I get to have an hour and a half in a class just on pronunciation. Um, and I often use the four books, one piece of material from all of the four books because they're, they're different approaches, uh, complementary. Um, you, you're, you might be talking about, for example, the E, I distinction. You can do that in a number of different angles, from a different angles, and that's what you can do. You can pick um, and mix the material from the books. Somebody wants to know about the I sound that appears at the end of words like century. Uh, this is known as the happy vowel because it occurs at the end of the word happy and um, in phonetics it's usually written like the E vowel but without the two dots meaning it's not as long as E happy. Um, it's a, a subtlety which I rarely get to teach because uh, it's not really that important uh, in my view to get to this level of detail in general English pronunciation classes, perhaps in a phonetics class, um, it might be relevant. Um, we just look for any more questions here. Somebody um, one, uh, has asked a question about uh, the word arrow. Um, sounding like arrow. Yes, it's true that uh, a and e uh, um, are susceptible to accent variation. In Dutch, for example, um, arrow would sound more like arrow. Um, and uh, that was something, it, it, as long as there's a distinction made, a consistent distinction, then I wouldn't say that the one of them was wrong. One of them isn't wrong or right, uh, as long as they the words are distinguished in some way, um, and they are in, in in Australian, for example, the e eh and a ah, um, are not the same as in British, uh, and so what? Um, as long as they they make the meaningful distinctions between sounds, that's the point. Any other questions? Ah, now I have a question about phonics from somebody who teaches in a bilingual class. Uh, I'm not an expert on phonics. Phonics is a, a way of connecting spelling and pronunciation. And uh, by my understanding is that it was developed for the purpose of helping native speaker children to um, write and read better. In other words, is to help native speaker children go from the pronunciation to the written form. And uh, as a pronunciation teacher in English as a foreign language, I'm doing the opposite. I'm going from um, the written form, usually, because usually my students uh, can read and write the words in English. Their, their problem is the pronunciation. So they're going in the opposite direction from what the phonics has been designed for. They're going from written to spoken in my class, but uh, phonics was designed for children going from spoken to written. They can already pronounce, but they can't read and write. So I have some doubts about it for that reason, but um, I am very much in favor of showing students the relationship between the spelt form and the pronunciation. It's unavoidable, especially for the vowel sounds. Um, it, the spelling is the, the major problem there. 
Um, my screen's gone blank. I don't know if you can still see me. Um, Mandy, are you still there? I can still see you, yeah. So we're okay. <laughs> I don't know if there's any right. questions from anyone before we finish. No, uh, okay. So we could finish there. Thank you for uh, coming along and tolerating the internet <laughs> connection. Yeah, well, these things happen. Modern technology, it's never as good as we want it to be. Thank you very much, Mark. That was very interesting. Uh, and, and the few of us that remain for the last bit, I'm sure we really appreciated it. <laughs> um, so thank you everybody for, for staying on. And um, as you all know, the webinar recording will be available uh, on the TESOL Spain web, web page. Thank you again, Mark. And lovely to see you and hope to see you again soon. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.